Uh, folks, probably one of our most beloved citizens here in the village, uh, and, and really Dare County as a whole, is, is Mr. Eve O'Neill. Uh, he's lived in Hatters his whole life. Uh, he knows so many people from Eastern North Carolina, and a lot of people know of him. He's a stellar reputation. He's the kind of people, uh, home folks, that we want our kids to emulate, that we want uh, generations coming after us to know that there are still uh, people like Mr. Eve and, and Miss Daisy uh, still in this community, and we're trying to preserve a little bit of that. Uh, tonight, if you have any questions or anything, it's just us. Uh, feel free to ask anything. I'm going to lead into a couple of things. going to show uh, Eve a couple of pictures from uh, the Standard Oil Collection. We'll talk a little bit about that and see what his uh, recollections of them are. But, Mr. Eve, uh, you've lived here in Hatters all your life. Is that, is that right? Just about all of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, three, one or year off working, and probably uh, I spent three, little over three years in the army. Right. And your wife is Miss Daisy. That's right. Uh, how long have you been married? Sixty-three years this past August. Sixty-three years. Don't ago. ask me how we can live with one woman that long. <laughs> She used to think she owns me. Now she knows she does. <laughs> well, Mr. Eve, how old are you? Power eight. Oh, yeah? 88. 88. Good 88. Place. This past January. Uh, how many children do you do you have, you and Miss Daisy? Three. Three. Uh, one boy and two girls. Uh, grandchildren? Grandchildren? Have you got grandchildren? Got um, eight grandchildren. <laughs> How to count them? <laughs> eight grandchildren, one great grandchildren. I think might be another one on the way. <laughs> well, when you were coming up, uh, you've been around the water most all your life. Yeah. And uh, what are some of your earliest recollections? I know. Uh, did you fish some with your father growing up? Did you, uh, when you had time to run down to the sound or down to the ocean, what did you like to do? Did you do some soft crabbing? Did you fish with your dad? Did you fish with relatives? What's some of your earliest recollections of being on the water? Being on the water, if you like it, is a pleasure. But um, it's beyond anyone's imagination what this island was like when I grew up and what it's like now. It's like going from a lighted room to a dark room. It's unreal. There have been so many changes. When I grew up, a man 40 years old was considered an old man. They called him uh, Old Man John or Old Man Jack. Yeah. Lifespan was short then. I never dreamed I'd have an air conditioning home and um, after some of them uh, cold, I mean hot summer nights I spent in the house with just the windows raised. One of the first things we did if you got a house was throw the keys away to the door. You had no use for them. Summertime, all your windows, was open, windows were open, your uh, doors wasn't locked. Nobody ever bothered anybody. Had a lot of changes, folks. You ask anything, I'll try to answer it. Okay. What, uh, uh, when you were a child, uh, what did you like to do with your free time? I know you're on the docks and probably your daddy had you bailing fish and stuff and you've had your own fish house for years, but what did you, did you like to crab? Did you like to soft crab or you like to do all of it? I like to do anything that had anything to do with the water. I like to fish, crab, clam, oyster, anything that, anything was on the water. They tell me the good Lord made two thirds of this earth water. I always thought I ought to fish two thirds of my time. 
<laughs> These 63 years, I haven't convinced my wife that's right. <laughs> I guess uh, back when you were a boy, uh, they really had just started coming in with motors and stuff. Had these old, I guess they were one cylinder motors. And do you have any recollection of uh, what it was like fishing with one of those? Uh, where, uh, I'd always heard they didn't have mufflers. Uh, those motors, they first, first it was sailboats. Then they began to get motors and the, um, the smaller boats, like 24 foot, 28, you know, I'll say under 30 feet, they had motors. It was one cylinder about this big around and about this high. It had a little petcock in the top, you open and close, you pour gas in now to get it started. And then you had a little pin and a big flywheel, you'd, you'd pull out with your finger and you'd get it cranked up like that and it would start running. And out on the front of it, they caught it fireworks, it was a spring on a thing that bolted, and on the inside of that was the points that made you fire. And when that flywheel turned open, it, that spring went up and down, open and closed, and every time it would close, it'd make a spark and start the motor. To get it go backwards, you come in wanted to back up from the dock, you'd hold that spring open up, and when, you, and when that Big wheel quit turning, started doing this. You'd get it on the reverse side and turn it loose and she'd back up. <laughs> if you want to go forward, you'd hold it up again and it would, it would uh, start it back forward. There was no idling. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess those things were loud. Uh... Oh, there was a headache, a bushel of headaches, and never one of them. Pop, 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 real loud. What, what would they make, maybe four or five knots or not even that? They, uh, I've thought about it a lot of times. You could go, or had us in the Coast Guard station and go, well, where's Ocracoke Ferry Dock is here? This end of Ocracoke. And it would take you about 45 minutes to go over there. Maybe 45 minutes to an hour to go over there was all. Well, this is probably a dumb question, but uh, what's your preference? Some of the older boats that you fish with or some of the things they're making now? Uh, both had their place. You can, uh, there's an advantage in the, some of the boats now and a disadvantage in some of them. But the boats now are um, better and nicer boats. Well, the boats were built real well then, but the boats now, uh, I would say, is nicer boats. Of course, they're more expensive, too. Right, fiberglass. And, uh, back when you were coming up, you pretty much had to be a jack of, of all trades. Uh, I heard you explain a little bit about the motor, but I guess you had to know a little bit about carburetors. You had to know a little bit about, uh, you know, engines in general, but you know, I guess back when, when you were young and coming up and everything, you could just send something off the island to be fixed. You had to pretty much do it yourself. To do what? Uh, working on your boats or your cars or anything back, uh, you know, back when you were younger and stuff, back before World War II and stuff. I guess you had to know a little bit about everything. If the refrigerator conked out, or, uh, most of the men around here could, were pretty much jacks of all trades, weren't they? Uh, yeah, there have been so much change and things like that and the way we lived. The first Frigidaire I ever saw, and uh, this ain't funny, this is real. <laughs> My grandfather put a little post out in the yard. He put a little deck on it, and he built a little house over it. And he put, uh, we called it mosquito netting. There were little mice that you kept putting around your windows to keep the mosquitoes on it and put a door on it. If we had boiled beans at summertime, they put them in, out in that little house where the air grew through there and the, um, the netting kept the flies and bugs out. That was the first freeze down I ever saw. <laughs> yes. 
I worked for him one time, and well, a bunch of times. And Starter went out in the inlet, and the waves were getting ready to break in the, back, in the back of the bay. And I said, what are you going to do, Eve? And he said, uh, pass me that hammer. Give me that screwdriver. He took that thing apart, but they never the waves breaking in the bay. He put a nail in there, and that started. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the right version. <laughs> well, I, I guess now that we've got paved roads and stuff, uh, did that really change the makeup of the island? When, when you were coming up, uh, did you pretty much walk down sand paths that were there where the roads are now, or was things a lot different about getting around in the village? Everywhere you went, you walked the road on a horse. The only riding was was on a horse. Um, the roads were just dirt roads, water holes in them. Right. And the boys would slide across the ice in the winter time where it rained that night and it froze. But it was, um, there were, we call them little paths. And then you had your wider roads. Mm -hmm. Did you have horse and carts? And, uh, the roads were wider. The main roads were wider where the horse and cart were used. If you had a horse and cart, you'd make the road wide enough to get to and from your home with it. Did you have a horse growing up? or Always been scared of them. they bite me. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. Uh, what's some of your recollections of uh, some of the old timers? Who were some of your heroes? when you were growing up. I've asked you before about uh, Captain Homer Styron, who was the keeper of uh, the life-saving station over here, Durant's, which is not there anymore. But can you tell me a little bit about some of the men, and, and or some of the women, too, that you remember when you were younger? Maybe some were role models, some were just pure characters that you couldn't help but love? When I grew up, uh, we were boys. We're always in mission. Uh, part of the time, I'll say. <laughs> but um, an older man caught you doing something, he'd give you a whipping. He didn't play with you either. And then you had what your biggest worries was not him whipping you. If he went and told your mother, dad, he got another whipping, that was worse. And uh, we said, if I, if I spoke to an elderly man, I better say mister or miss to a woman. Miss Sue or Miss Joe or uh, you just didn't come right out and say Joe, uh, Jill or unless your parents hear you. And the older people then, they, 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 didn't, uh, they didn't play around with kids. When they told you something, they meant it. And they sure knew what a, my daddy knew what a belt was made for besides hold your pants up. Uh, I'm going to throw a couple of names out to you. Uh, did you, uh, do you remember uh, Mr. Ander Austin had a store in the village? Yes, sir. Yeah. What's, uh, I guess he's a pretty good businessman. Now that store was there for years. Yeah. He's yeah, a good businessman. Yeah. How about uh, Mr. Dan Odin? Oh, yeah. Very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Charlie Balance, uh, Perry Austin, some of these fellows, uh, were they? Uh, let me show you a picture here and ask you a little bit about this picture. Y'all may have seen these photos from the Standard Oil Collection taken in 1945. Uh, real quickly, Standard Oil uh, was uh, the forerunner of what is now Exxon Mobil. And in 1939, I believe it was, uh, Standard Oil had sold our rubber rights in Indonesia to the Japanese. So they had a black eye for many years here. They came out here looking for oil uh, in 1945, uh, looking for natural gas. And one of the things they were trying to do to get back in the good graces of the American public was going out and taking a little bit of snapshots of life wherever they may be. Now, they had a gentleman out here by the name of Saul Libson, who was a native New Jerseyan, and 
uh, he recorded a remarkable record of life here. And I don't think he knew at the time uh, what he was doing would be something that has become such a treasured resource. But I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, uh, you've got Andrew Austin there, Mr. Andrew Austin in the Hatters vernacular, it becomes Ander. Uh, but those fellows, they all look pretty dapper. Uh, you know, when we think of fishermen sitting around the stove and everything, they've got, you know, got their old scrubs on and stuff. But these guys are dressed in suits. Uh, was it a Sunday? Did, did, uh, do these, did these men like to come out? And what was the social life like back then? Uh, was his store? That picture was almost an every night ordeal. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, three brothers here, Mr. Perry, Long, uh, Perry Austin, Mr. Crawford Austin, and um, Mr. Lawrence Austin. They lived right out here. These last houses over, and uh, just about every night, they'd come in on late of the evening after dark and sat down and they had a limited amount of time they talked and then they got up and went home. You could almost find them there every, um, almost every evening. Did you ever meet, remember being part of any conversations like that? Did your father or uh, uh, ever come and, and sit by the stove at some of the stores and talk about uh, things of the day? Well, not this particular store. But um, because their store was closer to where we lived, Mr. John Meekings had a store where Virgil lived. Um, he sold gasoline there. They got it here in 55 gallon drip barrels. And um, uh, Mr. Dan Oden, they had a store there, and he didn't have, um, he never sold gasoline there. Mr. Lauren Balance had a store, a place close to this store where the um, fire department is now, where the uh, sheriff's office is now. They had a, um, you go there and had a handle, you pump, had a um, tank, we'll call it, up on top. And you pumped and it had one gallon, two gallons, three gallons, up to five. You pump that handle, and when it got up to the amount of fuel you wanted, five or under, then you had a hose with a nozzle on it, siphoned it down back into your car. And uh, Mr. John Meekins, he had a down where Virgil store is, he had a um, gas pump there, and uh, the same thing. And they got their, um, most of your transportation, all of your transportation then was by boat. There was no ferries or nothing. Um, at Oregon Inlet. You had a mail boat, two mail boats. One left Matteo in the morning, early morning. Came this way. Stopped the waves, rode down to Salville, Avon, Buxton, Frisco. They'd take a small boat and pole off with a pole, a paddle, shove it off to the, meet the mail boat, whoever delivered the mail to the post office. The boat would come here and spend the night. And then when they went back, they would pass each other, coming and going, two boats. We had a freight boat run to Elizabeth City. <clears throat> that was owned by uh, this man, Mr. Andrew Austin, and I think Mr. Uh, one or two other people here. Uh, they carried fish up there, the Globe Fish Company in Elizabeth City. They carried, um, they brought ice back in 300 pound blocks. Or it wasn't blocks, it would be about so wide and about so long and so high. And they had ice shaves they'd shave it up with <coughs> to pack fish. And um, they had a sailboat, Mr. Andrew Oding had a sailboat that went to uh, Washington, North Carolina. Carried fish over there and brought freight and ice and brought back and more there. And they had a little motor into it. it would, when there was no wind at all, it would chug it along, but they used a sail 
use a sailboat for to come and go with. What's some of your recollections of school? Did you go to school at the schoolhouse across from Ander Austin's? Yeah. Do you remember any of your teachers? Were they all local local ladies? Oh, no, mm -mm. no. There was <clears throat> there was one or two local. I'd say the majority of them was off the island. What's some of your what would a typical uh, school day go like? What time did you have to be in there at eight o'clock in the morning or later or? No, master? they had, uh, yeah, they had a regular time. I don't recall, seven, eight o'clock. Uh, school, they had a bell up on the school building and a, and a rope down below where you could run over a wheel and it did rang the bell. And uh, you had a first bell and a second bell. I don't know why they had two. First bell, I guess, would get you ready and the second bell for you to come in. They weren't very far apart. But um, we had a pretty good school, I would say, for then. Good school. Did uh, was it all twelve grades right on up from? What um, we... I can't remember. Yeah. It was either eleventh or twelfth. I'm not sure which. Right. Uh, anything that you uh, remember? Was there? Uh, you know, anything that stands out during the school day? I guess people could come and go. Uh, you know, did, did you go five days a week like they do now, Monday through Friday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Eve, what's, uh, I know uh, you've been through quite a few hurricanes. What's, uh, can you tell us one or two that really stand out in your mind uh, that was real bad here in the village? 30, we, <clears throat> I'm not positive I'm correct on some of these days. We had a 33, a 35, and I believe a 36. And we haven't had nothing like them since. No comparison. Wow. Now, people laugh at me and say, you don't know what you're talking about, but I hope you never, I hope you never see one like it. We had some rough storms in. We had a low, flat, Beach. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the engineers, but you can't tell them nothing to know it all. <laughs> Pardon me for putting in you. <laughs> but um, in 33, 1933, the Park Service, I mean the um, CCs come in here. There were young men looking for jobs, and uh, they got Pay wasn't much, but they got, they was a job and a place to sleep and something to eat. And they, um, then we had a, uh, they were up here at, um, we're in Lighthouse area, where the Lighthouse is now, somewhere near that area. Then we had WPA camp come in, that was older men. They were at the Brigham's Bay, where Brigham's Bay is now, in there. And they, um, they built sand dune fences up and down this beach to uh, protect the beach, to keep the waves back. Uh, they did it for a good cause, but I, in my opinion, it's the worst thing that could have happened to us because the beach began to erode. And they, they hired, when waves come up, when you pour water out of a bucket, when you first pour it on flat ground, that's the most force. As it goes, the force slows down. All right. They built this high beach. Now when the water reaches the top of it and narrow, they take a wide flat beach, made a narrow high beach out of it. And when this water comes to the top of this beach now, and as it comes over, it comes down the farther it goes, the faster it goes. And that's what gave us so much damage here in this storm. But you and I can't tell engineers how to do it. You know, I, I see, uh, just from a, a layman's terms, but, you know, at first blush, it would seem that what you're saying is, uh, is correct, because when that water comes in, you're talking about a huge, flat but that water or that beach has a chance to displace yeah. all that water it's such a magnitude of water 
coming in that it has places to go. But when we went through what we went through here at Isabel, uh, you've got a point there. I mean, water came busting through there at the uh, breach, and it was all funneled right in there. And once it got beyond that, uh, caused us a lot of problems. Yeah. Um the shoreline has been built up, both heads and what have you. So you've got like a gutter. The water comes over and it builds up in here until it breaks through and gets out. And then it goes down. After the, after the Isabel, my wife says, looked out the window and says, uh, the top water's coming up. She says, Ty, it's coming up. I said, no, not with the southeast wind. We never had water before with the southeast wind. The, I never saw the ocean water to the uh, creek over here, or slice we call it, but in my lifetime until Isabel. It would come over and uh, there's some water ditches, hole, I call them ditches, holes down the back. It would come over to that and go through. But the beach was so flat with the island, it came with a real slow, very slow, and the most of it went in the sand. But now it comes so fast, you don't have time to go in the sand. Nature did its own engineering way back when. It had been that way for hundreds, even thousands of years. Yeah. But we've kind of been, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, tampering with things a little bit, I guess, yeah. way nature. I'll say something you might not want to hear, or, or <laughs> but um, this Isabel wasn't nothing. What will happen, we have another hurricane because here the beach was wider. It's from here, you go that away, the beach got wider, farther from the sand dunes. Now that's all gone. We have another hurricane. You're going to see all of this and a lot of this gone. And I hate to think about it. You remember what I told you? I'll probably, I may not, I may be here and I may not. When, if we could get the federal government to come in here and put us about 300, about 200 yards, about 600 feet of slow, flat beach beyond these dunes, it would be good for 70, 80 years. When I was a boy, you'd go over here, we boys go over here, go to the beach swimming. You come to the edge of the grass and you had nothing but sand, probably three, 400 feet. You'd have to run a little ways to kick out a hole and put your feet into it. They'd be so hot. Let them cool off and run a little farther to get to the ocean. And, and that was flat. And when, a, when that wave broke, the farther it comes, the slower it comes, the water. But this time, when it come over these dunes, high, high beach and over these high dunes, it come down with force. What did you like to do when, uh, when you had time? To, you talked a little bit about uh, going to the beach there. Did uh, y'all spend a lot of time on the ocean side, or did you spend most of your free time on the shore side? Or we boys were ever where we shouldn't be, <laughs> <laughs> and some of the ladies were helping us. <laughs> uh, we boys were the beach, in the sand, swimming in the beach. We were all over the island, different times. When you did, uh, way back when, you had to do, before we had cars here and stuff, you had to do a lot of walking. Uh, do, do, had you ever walked to Ocracoke Village, or had you ever walked to Buxton, or? I never walked to Ocracoke in a uh, village, but I walked from Ocracoke to Hatterson it twice. That's a good 12 miles, isn't it? You, uh, would you just walk down the beach, is that, or did you stay stay to the inside? Uh, we boys would like to go over that the 4th of July. And I fished with a man, this was in the 30s, before World War II, or in the late 30s. And uh, we went around one summer and fished over, from over there for mullets. And uh, after he came back, we liked to go over there. And uh, he let us have his boat sometime. We go to and then Hatter's Coast Guard Station was on the where the Hatter's Ferry Dock, Oak Goat Hatter's Ferry Dock is now. He let us go over there and leave the boat, and we'd ride down with a fellow cat brought and carried mail. 
And uh, twice we got stranded down there and had to walk back Sunday night. Because we'd had to be back a certain time the next morning to go fishing or we didn't get the boat anymore. But um, everywhere we went, we had to walk. I tell you what, kids think they've got it hard now. Hmm. It's unreal. You people can't imagine the changes been in my lifetime. I mean, here on the island, and not only just here, but all over the country. Uh, World War II rolled around. Uh, is that when you went in the Army? Mm -hmm. Most of the boys went to Coast Guard and Navy from here. Well, I didn't want to go in either one. I stayed home until I got a letter one day from uh, one of these kind of long envelopes. Opened it up and had a big white page in it. it said, greetings. <laughs> You've been selected by your friends and neighbors to serve in the armed forces of the United States of America. I don't know what kind of neighbors they were. <laughs> Where, where'd you, uh, so uh, you had to make your way to Norfolk? No, then had ferry and, uh, had ferry and uh, cars. There was cars here then, a few cars then. And uh, you could drive up the beach. And uh, Toby Tillett run the ferry across Oregon Inlet. He had a ferry and uh, if he was on the other side and you you can't went up on this side and you want to come over, he had a flagpole and you'd raise the flag up the pole and he'd come yes, he didn't. He'd wait till he got another car to come over. And you get across that way. Didn't pay to be in a hurry back then, did it? You didn't get in, <laughs> you didn't get in so much of a hurry it was at all. Uh, where did you what, did you serve overseas, or were you here in the United States uh, during your tenure in the army? I first went in. I went to Fort Bragg. I had to go to Fort Bragg. They were done. Uh, so I was drafted. What they call the draft. Most of the boys, when they got their call, like they'd wait till they got their draft call, and they go to run right up in North and go to the Navy or Coast Guard, and they didn't have to go to the army. Well, some boys weren't very bright. <laughs> they had a bed to sleep in the night, so I did. <laughs> uh, I got a call. I go to Fort Bragg. They gave you a physical, and uh, then they give you a week to come home. You came home for a week, and then to get every business or anything you had taken care of, then you uh, had to report back. You went through process and uh, plenty of shots, needles and uh, signed you some words. I got sent to Fort Bend in Georgia in an officer's candidate school. And uh, I stayed there nine months and I got shipped out of overseas. Did you get married? Uh, were you married when you went in the service or you got married when you got back? No, after I, no one, I was in the service. Okay, so. After I came back from overseas, I was home on leave, I got married. Uh, what's your, did you date Miss Daisy when you were growing up? What's your recollections of, uh, she no, I, I dated her daughter and didn't like her because she aggravated her. Sometime her mother would make us take her with us. <laughs> <laughs> we had a movie theater here then. We had a movie theater when I was a real young boy. Toward the Atlantic View, right in front of where the Atlantic View Hotel is now. Or a good, I'd say a building probably may not be quite as large as this, but almost. That's silent movies. Can you, uh, was, it, was it usually a pretty good crowd in there? Mm -hmm. Usually a pretty good crowd in there? I guess they had movies, what, every Saturday night? I don't remember. No, I. I think they had them more than Saturday night. It may have been just Saturday night, I don't recall. Did they have matinees for the kids or anything, or is pretty much just one movie for everybody? One movie for everybody. No talk and no sound to it. Then later years, Shank Austin, Mr. Randall Austin, the man that owned the store here, he, um, 
his boy in Shankhorst, and he built a theater there um, between uh, the Methodist Parsonage going into Village Hill. As you pass the Methodist Parsonage, right back in there, and that was uh, I would that wasn't silent movies. I know you've seen a lot of changes in, in fishing, and uh, I know that some of it has to aggravate you. But, uh, and it's not a loaded question or anything, but, you know, can you just give us a little bit of insight into, you know, what's happened to fishing? Uh, some of it could be good, but I think based on probably most people's recollections or experience, not all the changes that we've got here in fishing have been good. Uh -huh. Fishing, when I grew up, you went fishing. You caught fish any way you could, whatever way you could. There was no regulations whatsoever. We had plenty of fish. Um, and we had, this is not going to sound right, and some of you probably will oppose me on this, but we all, uh, we all have opinion of our own. We had uh, season, we had years. We had plenty of trout. Years, we might not have no trout, plenty of croakers or bluefish or other fish. Another year, in 19, in 30 to 35, I think all the large bluefish in the world came here. They were in the beach. People go out with rakes and catch them when they run up in the wash. They were so thick. The sign was full of them. Uh, in 35, I had never seen a large blue fish up until then. I'm talking about eight, 10 pound fish. Um, in 35, there were just a very few caught in the ocean. There wasn't any more till the 80s. I never saw another large blue fish until the 80s. Uh, they come and went. And it all seems to go through cycles. We had plenty of fish until the marine fishery got involved. <laughs> uh, there's, there's only one thing wrong with the marine fishery. It's not governed by the marine fishery. I'm going to give you my opinion. It's dictated to them by other groups. And there's not a person, on, they tell me how many fish is out here in the ocean, how many is in the sound. There's not a living person can tell me how many fish is in the harbor here now. Not a person on earth. But they're telling me how many is way out there in the Gulf Stream and how many is in the sound and putting regulations. If it hadn't been for commercial fishing, there'd be no people living in the years back. Because another, the, uh, my grandfather was a carpenter most all, most of his life. When he died at 84 years old, he had built or helped build or 75 percent of the homes here on Hatteras, some in Buxton, Avon, the churches, and other buildings. But. Uh, Nobody, nobody would seem like when they start restricting fish, the fish went. I've seen striped bass three times in my lifetime, a lot of them. The rest of the time, I didn't see any. Uh, this, I forget the first time, when I went into service, the fishermen would bring striped bass and you'd pile them up in the fish house floors. When I came home, I never saw a striped bass. Dennis Robinson and Roy Gray myself started fishing on the beach hole staying in the winter time. We fished about eight, seven or eight years before we ever saw a striped bass. And it began it more and more and more. And it reached a high peak and then in a couple of years it was all gone. There wasn't any for several years more, back in the eighties. Now they're going again they were, the, the commercial fishermen were deprived 
of the of their income, but not letting them have them when they're here. And now nobody's got them and they're gone. Amazing. Uh, you had told me a story, or I forget where I was, but uh, uh, you were down to Moorhead, and uh, you've always taken a, an active role in representing the fishermen here, and for that we're grateful, Mr. E. But uh, I know sometimes you run into a little lighter side, and I've heard you tell the story of uh, y'all were down there, things had not gone very well with a meeting with fisheries, and you and some of the other gentlemen uh, asked there at the motel where there was a place to eat. And they told you of a restaurant down the street, and you told me that you went there, and uh, you weren't in the best mood, but did you? <laughs> Who told you that story? <laughs> well, has Spurgeon been talking to you? Spurgeon. <laughs> We're gonna get Spurgeon up here one day. His time's coming. What were you saying? Can you t tell me about your trip to the sanitary fish market there. You told me you'd been drinking tea all evening and needed to go to the bathroom. That was about uh, eight or ten of us down there on a business trip. We asked the people to motel where we were, a hotel where we were staying, where was a good place to eat, and they told us. So we all go there and they put us in a little room, big enough for us, but a nice table. The waitress throws us our tea, summertime, hot weather, serves us our cold iced tea, and we're kind of slow getting our dinner out. So uh, we kept sitting out drinking tea and drinking tea, so I said, well, I gotta go to the bathroom. But I hated to go, I kept sitting out, and finally I said, I just got to go. So I, there's a little booth up there, and the lady sitting there, the cashier, I walk over to her very politely and ask her where the boy, little boy's room was at. She says, right down this hallway. Well, he was probably um, four foot wide. And I'm going down in a different room. They're looking different things in different rooms over the top of the door. And I come to three chairs. Well, there's just enough room for one person to go by. And I looked and I saw a fellow coming toward me. <laughs> I did feel stupid. <laughs> I motioned for him, I stepped back and motioned for him to come on. He motioned for me to come on and he stepped back. Well, he didn't come so I had to go. I stepped out and motioned again for him to come on. Well, he, he did the same thing to me. And when I stepped back, I said, I'm going. So here I go, and here he comes. <laughs> and just before we met, it was nothing but a big mirror on the whole end of that wall. I was looking at myself and thought it was somebody else. <laughs> and honestly, believe me, I hadn't had a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me some more about the army before you get. Okay. Uh, I want to. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the army? Uh, about your experiences there? Uh, anything you remember? Yeah, I. I was sent. They, they put me on a. Uh, we went to Patrick Henry, Virginia. If you know where that is, they sent us out from. I got, I got sent from, um, they did away with the school in Fort Bend and they sent me to a group of us, some to the Pacific and some to the Atlantic. They sent us to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, then to Patrick Henry, a shipping departure depot. We were 18 days getting to, uh, but when we went by Hatcher's that afternoon, I could see Bucks and Lighthouse. If they'd give me a life jacket and say, if you think you can make it, go to sight, I believe I tried it. <laughs> but um, we landed in um, Oran, Africa. Spent the night, we put on a limey transport, 
and sent to uh, Naples, Italy. I don't think the Mediterranean motion ever got any rougher than it did for two days. They had us in the hold of the ship, it was a transport ship, had us in the hold of her, and uh, you took a pail, a wooden pail, had tables, you had hanging bunks, you just put them up, fold them up, and tables where you ate the days. One fellow would take a wooden pail and go to the galley and get the food for his table. They fed us stewed goats, stewed down to a mess. And I haven't wanted any goats before or since. <laughs> that was terrible, but uh, they landed us in Naples, Italy. Well, they taken our rifles away from us when we left. And I knew we were going to be a good while before we ever saw any fighting. Within myself, I thought that. They landed us in Naples and uh, went to, uh, it was one of Mussolini's racetracks. Had a, uh, a place that I set up the Army did for uh, processing you. Uh, they fed, they gave us, the, sec the third night, they loaded us on a, not the same one, there were some of us, but one or two of us were the same boys. They loaded us on an army transport and sent us to um, our LCI and sent us to uh, uh, Hansville Beachhead. We stayed there uh, two months in a 12 by, about a 12 by 15 mile area. And right in front of us was high mountains and you could see the German trucks vehicles driving us when the sun sometimes would flash on their flash on their uh, windshields and stuff, windows, when the sun was in the right direction. We stayed there, um, this boy stayed down three months. I believe there was more men lost there than any one place during World War II. It was more lost on Normandy in one day. By the time we stayed there, I've read where there was more soldiers lost their life there than any place in World War II. We stayed there uh, three months before they pushed out and went into uh, Naples and went on. But uh, I got sent back to the hospital while I was there. I stayed there about a month and a half. Just before they left, I got sent back to Naples Hospital. Then I got shipped back in home from there. And I'll tell something I've never told before. Uh, I was awarded a bronze star. It's the only time I've ever told that in public. I didn't. It wasn't something I did other than to try to survive. I got sent back to the States. And I came back to, I came back to, uh, I got 19 days in the National Hotel in Miami Beach. That wasn't an army I'd been in. <laughs> then I got sent to Fort Benning, and from Fort Benning, I was getting discharged. I was getting just charged on a point system. The infantry didn't have many points. I only had 45 points. And uh, the, the Germans made their last big push in the bulge. They sent us our force boy, our army boys that had come back and once they hadn't got discharged to the Air Force and just swapped us for our force boys and put them in the infantry. I got sent to Keith the Field, Mississippi. And then I stayed there to Keith the Field about two months. And they sent me right on they couldn't have sent me any closer home and not been home. They put me on an IRC rescue boat. And I, I stayed on that boat, and all I did was fish the rest of them. Thank you.
thank you for sharing that. That's, a, that's <laughs> amazing. I want to show you another picture here. I know you like to shoot pull, and I hear you're still pretty good. Uh, but uh, this is another one of the pictures from June 1945, and evidently there's a pool hall here in the village somewhere. Here. Mm -hmm. Right there where, um, right here where the um, sheriff's department is. Uh, it may not have been where the sheriff's department, but right in that area, right close there. I would say right somewhere about where the, yeah, that belonged to Mr. Lauren Valance. He's the one that had the, um, sold, he sold gas, first gas, some of the first gasoline was sold out of pump that you pumped it up in the top. And uh, he, he, um, Harold Gray, fellow Harold Gray, married his daughter, and he came in there and worked with him. It was just a little small shop there, it had a little store stuff in it, canned stuff, and he built a long place on the back and had about four, I believe he had, if I remember right, four pool tables in there. It cost you a nickel to play a game of pool. Five cents for a game of pool. I recognize that. Well, I, I can I can look at these I can look at this picture here and I recognize some of these fellas. Uh, that's Dud Burris, uh, Dwight's father there on the left. I wish I could get these up closer to you. And then next to him, uh, I'm not sure who that fella is, but I think this over here on the right with his arm out the window seal is uh, Edgar Starin and shooting uh, pool there. I believe that's Oliver O'Neill. That's uh, Bertha Kay's father. Uh, do you know who that fella is next to Dud? He's obviously younger. Uh, kind of hard to say. I'd wondered if that was you. Over here. Yeah, isn't that Edgar Starin? It could be. I can recognize Dudley Burris and Oliver. The other fellow, who'd you say he was? Uh, I don't know. I was hoping uh, at one time I'd heard his name. Uh, I, uh, probably Miss Dixie would know or somebody. I, uh, just two of them I recognize. That could be uh, Edgar. All right, how about this picture here? That I'm told that that's. Uh, H.J. Willis, uh, pulling that skiff around the harbor. I, I couldn't recognize okay. him. I can res recognize the rest of the picture, but uh, well, that's I'll, where that's I'll where your fish that. house was, wasn't it? Huh? What what your fish house? Just about right there, or fish house is now? Yeah, in that in that uh, small boat, I. I uh, I can't recognize them. I've been told that's who it was. Right. Do you remember when the uh, fish houses were offshore, off uh, Sheep Island out here, out beyond the breakwater? Oh, yeah. Mr. John Meekins had the store where Virgil is. He had a walkway. It was probably four foot wide. He went from that store over to the sign, right on out, all the way out to, fish, to his fish house and grocers. All the grocers came on the boat that I was speaking about going to Little City and Washington. They'd pull into the fish house and they'd unload uh, his uh, grocers and stuff. And he'd take a, pull a handcart out there and, and pull it back with the grocers on it. Do you remember anything about the porpoise fishery? I know that was probably a little, well, I don't know. When you were a boy, it was probably still active. Uh, William Harris Rollinson, W.H. Rollinson, uh, uh, Jarvis Midget, uh, Horton Austin, some of these guys. You, do you remember anything about the porpoise fishery we had here? I remember all the, all the uh, names, people. Um, I was right on the getting old enough to know and remember things, and I wasn't quite. I remember they had. Uh, they had a place down the road here, far down from the beach father. They had a little camp there. They had their boat there and their net. And they uh, they had a fella up the beach, uh, probably uh, 
six, five or six hundred yards, seven or less. Uh, had him a little place built out for him to set up in, and he had a flag. And when he saw porpoises coming down the beach, he waved his flag, and they'd get the boat ready for him. By the time the porpoises got there, they were ready to set net around them. They had one on the south side of them, the same thing. And uh, I can remember the little camp they had there, and I remember the older people talking about it after I got older, but I wasn't quite old enough for to uh, remember that. And they had a factory on the, where the creek comes through the island where they keep the boats. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they had a porpoise factory over there. I don't remember the factory, but I remember the tank. I don't remember the building, but I remember the tank. I wanted to uh... See if anybody had any questions or any uh, observations. Uh, anybody, uh, jump in. Miss Lynn? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eve, you must think I'm close to your age because you insist that I call you Eve, not Mr. Eve, in the tradition. Uh, we're neighbors, and you have a great garden, and you have actually a farm next door. Did, you all, did your family always have chickens and, and vegetables? I'm a little hard hearing. I can't hear her. She's talking about uh, your garden that you had there. She's your neighbor. Did she, you had uh, chickens and y your daddy and mom and daddy had a garden there? <clears throat> my grandfather liked to live out of his garden. My mother died when I was 12 years old. And uh, <clears throat> my father worked with the Army Corps of Engineers up in, uh, uh, mostly out of Philadelphia on these uh, hopper dredges. And uh, he, they got 30 days a year off, and sometimes they get a little. He'd go up there and work two or three years. Fishing be slow. The fishing get good. He come back home. He didn't go back. And my mother died, and I had a brother, one brother, who was all. And our grandparents lived about just a couple hundred, 300 feet from us, where we lived. And uh, my brother and I went to live with our grandparents. And they raised us until uh, we lived with them until I went into service. Was your grandfather from Oakley No, that was my grandfather on my mother's side. He was from Hattress here. He's the one that's a cardinal. He built the houses. And uh, my father was from Oakley Coat. Anybody else? Bob? You ever do any hunting? You were a kid. You ever do any hunting? Ever do any hunting? Hunting. Rifle. My wife would have had a better husband, I reckon, if I hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. When I wasn't fishing, I was duck hunting in the wintertime. There was no law. Well, they had a game warden here, but he didn't bother nobody. He just got a check. <laughs> And we had it, we started when the first duck come and quit when the last one left. <laughs> and uh, I've done a lot of deer hunting. I have it for about maybe six years now. I haven't been uh, deer hunting. And, uh, I mean deer hunting. I've been deer hunting, but I haven't been deer hunting. But I haven't done any duck hunting in about uh, five or six years. I've been watched her twice, but I haven't done much. Did you ever eat any pipe and clover? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you ever eat any of those shorebirds everybody's fussing about these days? He's over here. Fellow Levin, Levin uh, Culture. Oh, yeah. Whittled him out some bird decoys about this long. And then there was what is, um, Coast Guard telephone line that came down here. They had the first telephones in here to the Coast Guard stations. where well, there's plenty of copper wire, and it was just the right size. You could put, more, put wood up in that tight in the wood and it, make it about this long and stick them down over here on the beach. And that, that would be in uh, April, first part of May. You'd go down to, when the tide was low and get a flatty place and put about 15 of them birds out, he had him a canvas bag and made he hung over his shoulder to carry them in. We'd go over there and we'd put them birds out and these red breast snipes. 
and sea chickens, we called them, and, and willets, and curlews. Man, man, that was good to eat. <laughs> I'm telling you. Was it as good as sea turtle? I'm sorry, I'm was a little it hard as, carry. Was it, Miss Dixie asked, was it as good as sea turtle? Sea turtle? <laughs> now, Miss Thelma Gray, I had the marina, village marina. Miss Selma Gray, Gwenny, Gwenny Gray, Gwenny, she worked for me, her daughter. Worked for me about 18 years. I'd get, uh, when I closed the marina, uh, the marina, I'd have uh, one or two coolers I'd leave on. I'd have little stuff into them, sometimes bait and some. And some. But I left one on for her if I put turtle in. I hope we no turtle washers in here. <laughs> She could make a pot of turtle hash, I'm telling you. <laughs> it was unreal. I'd have, I'd, we, we used to call the, one of the legs a quarter, a quarter of a turtle. I'd put about 15 or 16 quarters in the fat freeze box, and every now and then she'd, uh, or she would, or Duane would tell me to bring a, get her some turtle, and she'd cook it. She bring me a big bowl full of it, and I'd eat more than I should. Put it in the fridge, and I'd save for later. And in 15, 20 minutes, I'd eat the rest. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever remember? Did you ever see any fox growing up? Uh, did, is your collection? Uh, we're talking about all the foxes that are running around on the island, causing some habitat issues. Did you ever remember seeing any of those when you were coming up? I've never seen a fox on Hammers. On this side of the bridge, Oakland Bridge, we had a lot of fat. This this um, this fellow Anna Austin sold from the ferry dock to the inlet. That property to to uh, some people from up in New York, uh, well-to-do people for a hunting club, and they brought pheasants here and turned them loose, and they got all over the island. I used to love to hunt them. I had me a dog I'd hunt them with. Don't you still commercial fish right now? Aren't you still commercial fishing even now? Do I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I fished all last summer for mullets and put drums and what have you. Tell us how you oyster. How do you oyster? Mm -hmm. Oyster. <clears throat> uh, one of my grandson, Brian, my oldest daughter's son, uh, Peggy's son, some of you may know her, um, we've been oystering, and Michael Pilmer said we've been oystering. We started about, uh, I think, six or seven years ago going up to Oregon Inlet. Up there, you could catch them with what they call a scrape, a little dry thing you drag behind, pulled behind the boat with a bag in it, an uh, iron frame. and. Uh, we uh, started, we ended up out about three years in court, and we'd go down to Oregon and Bridge, go across the bridge out to the marina and put the boat in the water. And it was only about five minutes around. For about three years, we got go by and we could, we could get 15 bushels a day. Wow. And uh, then we, we found some here, <coughs> Cape Channel. A couple of years, we caught them there. For about three years now, we found some across the inlet where we get on board with the rig, with waders on and catch them. They were nice big oysters. And uh, after uh, this year, we caught some down there. And this year, right here, where this inlet came through, the farthest end of it, uh, my grandson uh, was down in the water one day and he found some. That was a place about half as big as not just a little bigger than a quarter of the size this room would be. Um, we caught, I expect there's close to 100 bushels caught there, and they were, some of them were as big as my hand. And they were the best, I mean, they were good oysters. But, uh, and they, what, where they came from, when they put this highway in, they used to rock pieces like this, and maybe so square, and maybe some pieces were more half that big. And that's what the moisture was growing on them little pieces of rock. 
and uh, this is where this highway washed out, and that rock washed through there and stayed on top of the sand, and the moisture grew on it. Wow. Did you see where the old bridge was after Isabel cut through up there? Did you see where the old bridge was, the 33 bridge, when uh, Isabel cut through? Did that bring back any memories? Oh, I remember that well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that well. <coughs> All the time we got the bridge filled, fixed the beach filled in, and they didn't have any problem, didn't need the bridge. I remember the bridges going across the bridges that were New England is, after people began to get cars here at this side of Oregon in it. Well, they probably, had, they probably had right many cars by the time you were old enough to remember. I, I always heard the first vehicles got here before World War I. My grandfather bought a new car. I think he paid $500 for it. It was a whippet. I don't know if you ever heard of one or not. It had a rumble seat in it. It closed, opened up and closed. Man, that was something nice. <laughs> that beat them horse and cars. <laughs> Do you remember the lighthouse that was between here and Ocracoke? Do you remember the lighthouse that was between here and Ocracoke? Light tower? Do you remember a light? Light tower between here and Ocracoke? Mm -hmm. Or here in the inlet, was there a... There was a tower between... Um, here and the inlet. Uh, part of it is down now, they take part of it down. But that would the Coast Guard had that there. Uh, <clears throat> they put a man in it to watch boats around the inlet. They didn't have these radios and stuff then in boats. And uh, if a boat got it, had problems there, sometimes they could see them. Or if you were in your boat and you had some problem out of your motor quit and you, you had to anchor or you were drifting in the breakers or something, or drifting off, and uh, if you needed help, uh, you could wave something and put something up, and I'd have binoculars to watch you with. That's why that tower was formed. There's a uh, small part of it is still there now. Anybody else? Do you remember anything about the, how electric power came to the island or how that got established? Do you remember anything about how electric power got the island or how it was established? Uh, Mr. Fraser Peel, do you know anything about the first yeah, plant? Yeah, the, um, I was here before that was. <laughs> um, there's a gentleman here, came here from Newburn. Latham. Mm -hmm. Latham. No. Tommy. Eaton. Thank you. It's Tommy. That's right, Tommy. Um, and it, <clears throat> he got in with Fraser Peel. <coughs> Fraser Peel's house was right across from between the fishing staff and the um, and Sunday's restaurant. Fraser Peel had a house there, and he lived in it. And uh, Tom, this fellow Tom Eaton, they uh, got to be friends, and uh, Tom had money. What was money then? He came in here, he got interested in the island. I had a village here to have us. He came in here and uh, him and Fraser got to be good friends and uh, they got in business together. They built an um, ice plant here. They, uh, they made uh, 300 pound blocks of ice and they made a lot of it. It supplied the whole uh, Hatchers and Buxton or Trent or anybody that could come in here and want to come in here and want to get ice. They sold the ice. And um, they had a good, nice building down there. And they had a quite good sized metal building. Hadn't been too many years. You can remember that. Yep. Uh, some of you people might remember it. And uh, they, he got the channel dredged, uh, the main channel. The, the freight boats went out, they had to go up around the reef and come back out and get the sound. They had to go about um, oh, three or four or five miles up here and maybe three or four miles 
and then come back and out, get around the reef where there's an opening in the reef, deep water, where they could go through. And uh, uh, they got a channel dug by the Corps of Army Engineers right straight up from where the channel, main channel is now where boats go out. And uh, they bought fish there and they run freight and stuff to Englehart. Do you remember uh, Mr. Tom Angel? Yes, sir. He's what, the what? only man on earth that ever knew how to make ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> What's some of your recollections of him? I've always heard that uh, he was just a just a beautiful, beautiful person, beautiful soul. Um, he came, some people have said Newburn. I was told, the understanding I can recall, he came from uh, Washington, North Carolina. But um, he, um, oh, uh, this angel part was the lady and her husband that got him here, brought him over here to do their work housework, yard work, whatever they wanted him to do. Raised him from a small boy. And uh, he, uh, Mr. Angel, I can't think of his, don't recall his first name. Tom. He, oh, okay, Lou? Hmm? What, was it Lou? Louis Angel. Louis, Louis okay. yeah. Okay, well, in any yeah. event, sorry. He, uh, they were from Newburn. They, uh, he, um, he died first. Then his wife died, <clears throat> and when she died, she left the whole estate to Tom, the colored fellow. And at it, his death, he went to their heirs in Newburn. And uh, when the Scoosville Gun Club came here, it had this property, that was the name of it, from uh, Ferry Dock to the Inlet. They, uh, they, he, could, he was a good kid. They got him down, they, when they were here hunting or fishing or something, any of them, they'd get him down there to cook their meals for them. And, but before that, he built them just a deck off from the house and put a roof over it with no walls in it and built him a little house out to one end of it. And he made ice cream in his old ice cream freezer. You, crank it with the turn to, and he'd get us boys to turn the crank. We'd love to do that because he'd give us the backbone. We called it the backbone. The thing went down in the ice cream, he churned it. He'd give us that to eat the ice cream often. And he sold ice cream our Saturday nights. And people from all our houses here would walk down there and, and uh, go down and get ice cream at night. Had a little table set out there. you get a Cup a uh, little plate, it's some in a little plate light for a nickel, and for a dime you got a little thing set up on little legs like this little cup thing full, and that was good ice cream. <laughs> they lost the pattern of ice cream when he died, <laughs> or maybe we were just boys and thought it was that good. <laughs> His uh, those hours when they had this doings up here to Buxton, I don't know four, five, six years ago, lighthouse thing, have to move the lighthouse. Uh, my wife's uh, grandfather was in the lighthouse service. And we were up to the doings up there. And uh, <coughs> coincident, I ran into some of the heirs of the, uh, that property down there. And I taken them down there and showed them where it was at, where the old house. If you could have seen that house now, it would be worth Lord knows how many millions of dollars. I saw a picture of it. It was more of an antique, real antique thing on the uh, south side of it. I don't recall, I don't think it was on the other side. There was a vine, it must have been this thick, growed clear up to the roof. It was a two-story building. Growed clear up to the roof. And just to, but didn't cover the windows, it kept it cut away from the windows. And it was um, the main house, and, and over here from it was a walkway porch, probably uh, 10, 15 feet 
to a little kitchen where uh, they cooked and ate at. And that was, that was uh, you've seen pictures of it? It looked like something out of a fairy tale. Yeah, I'm telling you, that was, that was, and the, the uh, some fella gave Tom Angel a fiddle, was supposed to be in a, I think 100 years old or 200 years old or something like that back then. And I think he gave that to Mr. Luther Austin. Uh, Mr. Anton Feller in this picture just now, Andros had the story here, Andros his brother. I don't know, I don't know what whatever happened to him, Mr. Luther died, who got it. And his Mr. wife may, or some of his children may have it. Mr. Luther ran the uh, Gooseville Gun Club. He was the caretaker of the club? Well, uh, his brother Gus. sold it to him, and he got the job tending to the club, yeah. Okay. Uh, he had another brother before him. Um, um, Ernest Austin. Okay. Um, you know Decatur Austin? Right. Um, uh, Bert Austin? Yeah. They're, they're Bert Austin and Decatur said daddy did it, intended to it first, and then he died, and Mr. Luther took care of it for him. Johnny, did you have a question? Yeah, Mr. Reed. Uh, Miss Becky Austin Gray told me a long time ago something about promenades they had on the beach at each village back in the 20s and 30s where people went to dance. Do you remember anything about that? <coughs> Becky Austin Gray told Johnny Baum about uh, back in the 20s uh, where people used to go to dance. They called them promenades. Do you know anything about that? You should go to dance to what? It was called the promenades. Is yeah, what something like a pier on the beach, a short pier or something. It's a short pier over the water that people used to go dance on. On the beach? No, not that I know of. Okay. It might um, the people then, I've known them, they, they had a, this Coast Guard station is still up here, right up between here and Frisco. Creed's Hill. The old building, it was a Coast Guard station. Creed's Hill, they called it. Old Creed's Hill Coast Guard station was up back of Buxton Woods. I. I didn't know where it was at. I doubt if I could find it now. But uh, when they closed that up there and moved down here to this building, they used to come and have choir dances up there. People did. I can remember when I was a kid going up there with my parents. They sat me on a seat and I'd sat there. <laughs> Any other questions? Where was, where was Mr. Uh, Tom Angel's house located at? Huh? Where was Tom Angel's house located here? Tom Angel's house. Where was it located? Um, Spurgeon, what's, what's the boy's name has a house there now? Charlie Barney. Huh? Charlie Barney. It's, it's, it was right behind my folks' house. Yeah, yeah. It's right back of where Ernie's father's house. Right back of that, where Ernie's. Oh, yeah. Ernie's father's house, there's a house back there. It's not right where Tom's house was. I think it's closer toward Ernie's house. There's a graveyard in there uh, where the, the original people own that deal. Uh, the angels. Uh, I mean, the ones that had it, the father and, the, and his wife buried, and Tom was buried there. Was, uh, was the uh, people that took him in uh, was it Oliver? I think uh, Oliver's Reefs out here was named after him. I think that Tom Angel's caretakers, people that adopted him, were keepers of the Screw Pile Lighthouse. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't recall it may anything about that. But my wife's my grandfather, he was in the Coast Guard. <clears throat> and I believe he was off there in this lighthouse one time. Uh, in them lighthouses, they had a house on top of that built there. It was up high above the water, probably eight foot, you know, probably ten foot above the water. But uh, my wife's grandfather and her grandmother, when her when my wife's mother was small, lived out there. Back in the 
believe it's in the twenties, early twenties or summers, late nineteens or early twenties, we had a uh, hard freeze year. And uh, I don't remember saying who the people were was tending to it then. Somebody stayed into it all the time and lit the light for boats at night to see it. And uh, they um, they had this hard freeze and the sign froze over. And they took a, some of the men took a three or four men took a small, real small boat that they could float, that they could big enough from the get in, in case the ice. Uh, broke, they broke through the ice, ice wasn't hard enough to buy them, and they went clear to the lighthouse to see if they had food out there. They'd been frozen for several days. <coughs> There's a lot of, folks, a lot of dead history here. Some of it will never be known, and what is learned pretty quick won't be known. There's about there's three of us men folks living this eighty old enough to know some of that. Myself, um, AC Peel, Monroe Still, and myself. And AC is uh, about 15, 16 days older than I am. And I'm about, uh, about 20 days older than Monroe. And Miss um, Kathleen, Miss Kathleen, and um, Miss Lucy. No, the older woman, Miss Margaret, and um, one or two more ladies. And a lot of it, if somebody doesn't find, learn it, write it down, or learn it, it's all going to be gone shortly. Or we're not going to be here. I made 80 years, and I'm hitting for 80 more, but I may not make it. <laughs> what advice do you have for young Patterson that want to live here and fish for the rest of their life? What kind of advice would you give them? What, do you, what kind of advice would you give young fishermen or young people who want to live here uh, the rest of their life for generations coming up? Fishing's over with here. Um, every year, uh, don't take my word for it, but some of you might know it. Go to find out for yourself. Uh, the marine fishery, they tried to get a net band here and didn't get it. It's the Coastal Compensation Association and some of those groups. They tried to get a net band here when they got one in Florida. Uh, I read in a magazine I know the dock one morning after they got a net band in Florida in a sport fishing magazine state and they said we won in Florida. Our next target is North Carolina and the state of Washington. Um, they've got the fishermen into advice like and they're slowly tightening it. They, they, they try to get a net band and the state Senate stopped it. But they're slowly tightening that vice. They're coming out with some new regulations right now. Uh, Spurgeon knows a lot about them. These other boys are fishing. Uh, you can go catch a hundred pound a group or a hundred fifty pound or something, but you've got to. Um, that's all you can have. With the cost of fuel now, you'd have to catch that many to pay for your fuel. So they can't. They can't do that. And they're, they're stopped them on every, every act. It's just a slow process. Stop me here. Stop. They stopped us on this rock when they had plenty of them. Nobody could catch them and sell them. They put you on a limit. And uh, we had piles and piles of them. Now they're gone. They're just wasted resources. It's like all the people that want to stop the pig farmer because there's an odor there. <coughs> they don't slide that plate of ham away from them in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm for everybody, folks. 
I'm not for jet. I'm for commercial fishing because I've been a he's been a part of my life. But I'm for all of it. But the way this economy is going now, there's all possibilities, and you might remember this. There's all possibilities. Five or six years from now, it ain't going back to some of what I have seen in the past. We, and when you get to the top of the hill, there's only one way you can go. You can go any direction you want to, but you're still going down. And there's a lot of history here that can be, that can be got, but it's been every year a little of it lost. Ernie? What's the best best fishing day you ever had? I can tell you the worst I ever had. Let's hear it. Spurgeon Spur Spur said, "Let's hear it." All right, I set for some rock up to up to Cape, out on the north side of Cape Point, and I busted my net. I got forty-five, uh, four thousand pounds. And there's another those um, Mac midget back my net. He got about uh, four, about four, uh, four hundred boxes, forty thousand pounds. A crew from New York was here that had a bag in her net. After Mac backed mine, they backed mine again. They got uh, eleven hundred boxes. Outside. 100 pound to a box. There were seven crews kept back in the nets. There were 2,100 boxes caught, and I had 40 of them, so that was one of my worst days. <laughs> my best day, I had seven, 670 boxes. I had uh, 760 boxes of gray trout. Wow. I was in the ages. I had to try it. That's a lot of. You took it off the beach with a front end loader and a dump truck. Ma'am? I said you took it off the beach with a front end loader and a dump truck. Yep. I had 14 trout. Everybody come to the beach when I caught them trout. I had uh, would would uh, bring a load of trout over for me. I paid 14 different truckers <laughs> for trucks and trout. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of fish sandwiches. A lot of fish. Yeah. But Lord, there's a pile of trout here. I've never seen nothing like that. They were about, they'd average two to three pounds. Some of them would go 12, 14 pounds. But where are they at now? We didn't catch them. Sounds like we did. How much did you get for them? How much did you get for them? What was the market price? I got 20 cents a pound for them. Wow, you got a new truck out of that, didn't That's you? the most I'd ever got for a fee trout. We'll get 20 cents a pound then. 20 cents a pound, that's amazing. I started fishing, we got three cents per pound, I tried five cents for anything that weighed three quarters of a pound or bigger. That wasn't much money. <laughs> when, after I got married, if I made $20 a week, I was getting along pretty good. And Where's all the crabs going? Just like everything else, dear, it goes through cycles. They'll come back, they go, and they come back. I t I'm going to tell you something I believe. You've got a kid down the floor, two kids playing. Uh, they got a whole bunch of toys. They start fighting or win. What do you do? You take that one, now when you learn to play like you ought to, you can have it back. I think there's somebody up above that controls these fish more than the marine fishery. And they might have to go to a low ebb. I think he's taking it away from them now 
until they learn to play like they want to. Those run for all of us, folks. If we'll just use it like we should.